Since the Second World War, there have only been two years in which a British soldier was not killed on active duty. But for some, the end of the war is just the beginning of the battle. More than 40 people who served in the UK Armed Forces have taken their own lives so far this year alone. And this week, I sat down with some of the toughest men I've ever interviewed, talking about one of the hardest things to speak about, mental health. <laughs> At the Brighton and Hove Amateur Boxing Club, veterans are marking the centenary of the First World War in a unique way. I am Phil Campion, former D Squadron 22 SA. Leave it far and parachute regiment. Jim Walker, former 22 SAS D Squadron. They joined the armed forces as teenagers. Now these three friends are trying to raise awareness and money for former colleagues who are struggling and who they believe their country has forgotten. The Remembrance Rumble charity boxing match pictures former members of the SAS against ex-US Special Forces. In a year where 42 former members of the armed forces took their own lives, the money is important, but just as crucial is seeing veterans as tough as these talk openly about mental health. Did any of you guys struggle with your own mental health? We talked a bit about mental health. Did you yeah, see, I, I, again, I, I struggled, you know, and again, it's not so much... I've struggled, obviously, well, on leaving the military, I went and done security, so I, I went from one battleground to another one, and that was fine because it was just one transition to, to back into private security. I really struggled when I left then because, actually, I was to fend for myself, you know, and I go back to, and there's, I remember it was PTSD, but, you know, the stresses and strains of life that you're not used to in the military actually come on top, and, you know, there has been times where I thought, you know, I can't do this anymore. Going from the military to then being a civilian in those environments, working alongside military, it was a struggle, because I was used to asking for things, and it would get done. And then, as a civilian, you ask for it, and they're like, well, who are you? Well, I'm so-and-so. Well, OK, there's a queue there, get to the back of it and wait. And I'm, like, well, I'm just trying to get this done. You see a lot getting out with the stresses. It's not just about being having a mental health issue, whether it be PTSD. What you actually find is that veterans are coming out. These guys and girls may have never paid rent before, paid the bills, the council tax. Then all of a sudden they're getting out and they're being told to fend for themselves. So they don't have those life skills. I joined the military at 16, so I don't know anything else. No, like, I'm fine. So, 16, yeah. yeah, yeah, right. yeah I was, I was yeah, 18. Yeah, right. yep. But resettlement is something that should start on the day you join. You should start learning about, you know, things that happen in Civvy Street and like, and like I say, predominantly the guy that sets you off into Civvy Street in the army would be some guy that's been all the way through the ranks, spent 24, 30 years in the military, and it has reached the rank of captain, and well done to him, and he's sort of like out there, past your ankles, getting himself shoehorned into Civvy Street with a nice big pension. He's never been a Civvy, so what right has he got to put me into Civvy Street? He doesn't know. Yeah. So that's when you need to visit someone who's probably been on the out for 10 or 15 years, who comes back in and says, right, OK, I work under the direction of this guy, but this is, this is where it is, this is where it's at, this is what you need to know. I didn't have a clue about anything when I got out. No. And like I say, even when I went to the job centre, the only job I was qualified to do was lollipop, man. It was insane. We leave and, you know, we have millions spent on us for training and then it goes in the bin, basically. And going back to the military to start off, when you turn up in the depot day one, you get taught how to wash, how to shower, and how to shave, and how to make a bed. When you leave, they don't teach you anything. It's, there's some paperwork. If you want to do a course, there's a course, and thank you very much. At least 42 former service men have been taking that own life since the beginning of this year. I mean, uh, and that is really in Chris, I think Christmas, across the board for sort of suicides anyway, I think that's when it, it yeah. rises, so, you know, we're that not... That figure doesn't look like it's going to slow down any time soon, put yeah. it that way. You know, there's, there's... I wouldn't say that figure's correct, the, the one thing that there isn't actually a way of getting data around actually how many veterans are taking their lives. I wonder if that is something that you think would be a good idea, actually, for the government to get yeah, a so, bit more so, information on what's Yeah, so there, is, and there, there has been campaigns to actually get a central database and actually work with some of these charities like Combat Stress, the RBL, um, and, and most other charities, Help for Heroes, and actually states them, OK, where are your funds going? Who have you helped? And actually, how many veterans have, have you, that you've helped have actually then gone to commit suicide? Because one of the things that charities do is they help you for a certain period of time and then they just push you out the door. And that's like they're ticking the box to the government. Um, there's no follow-up care. I know? think, you know, from the military's point of view as well, 
I just saw a scheme which has started up within the Royal Marines recently, which is a mentoring system whereby guys can go back and actually feel part of the system again. And I think, you know, as a prisoner coming out of prison with like a parole period or, you know, some sort of tie back to helping transition back into Sydney Street, I think some guys, not all guys, but some guys need that from the military as well. So do you Possibly think, do a two-year kill and off period or something like that where they can dip back in if they need to and feel part of something. Still. Do you think then that there's more support for people leaving prison than leaving the army? So? Possibly, yeah. possibly there is. You know, there's, there, there, there's a lot of structure around leaving prison, and there's a lot of thought put in, and there's a lot of sort of like preparation work with courses and all that sort of stuff. Now, I'm not saying that the army don't do anything at all, but they could do more. We're commemorating 100 years since the end of the First World War. How are you going to be remembering that day? It's, it's a long day again, isn't it? It's, it's a day when we do traditionally. You know, we, we've, we've all been in combat situations ourselves. You know, we remember our own, we remember other people, and more importantly, you know, it's, it's, it's about the whole thing, the, the whole deal, you know, from, from way back. It's not, just, it's not just today, it's not just one conflict. You know, this country's been at conflict repeatedly over the last, you know, since, since those wars, since World War I, you know, repeatedly, you know, you've got things like Borneo, Malaya, you know, all these different campaigns all the way through. So this country's never been without conflict. And so it's about just remembering the people that have been, been bold enough to go out on behalf of a democratically elected government and do something for us. You know, and just, you know, it's, 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 it's a time to remember them. And is there any people in particular that you're going to be thinking of? Um, yeah, there's also, you know, we've all lost friends and colleagues. Um, so, yeah, we, I always have a drink for them. Even, even the days when they lost their lives, um, I'll always stop, remember and have a drink. And, yeah, never forgotten. Yeah, and how about you? Yeah, no, obviously, uh, I'm an ex-Pashu regiment, so we've lost a lot of guys over the last, you know, 18 years since uh, Afghan and Iraq. So, again, it's, it's a time for me to remember uh, my friends that have lost their lives during these conflicts. Ahead of the solemn silence of Armistice Day, the Remembrance Rumble seemed a fitting way for these former Special Forces to pay their respects. In the end, it wasn't about winning, it was about remembering.